Oh, hello. <laughs> I got my little mask on. I'm gonna take it off just for the tour. My cameraman, Phil, is properly distanced and I gotta let this sick beard breathe, all right? Anyways, we're doing a little tour today, a little walk through Greenwich Village. Uh, it's a very historic neighborhood here in uh, New York City. Right now we're in Washington Mews, which is a little known alleyway here. I'll explain its significance here in a second. We're gonna walk down Fifth into Washington Square and get started. Right, let's go. The name Greenwich Village actually dates back to the 1700s, while New York was still a British colony, actually. Uh, and they got the name Greenwich from a neighborhood in London. Now, today, it's a, a very fancy neighborhood. Lots of famous people here. Uh, people like Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, Justin Timberlake, Mark Zuckerberg just bought a place in the West Village for $25 million. And we're walking down Fifth because this is where Fifth ends, actually. It's a Washington Square Park right here ahead of me. And this is the Washington Arch. Named after George Washington, the first president of the United States. Oh, that's great. And there in the front, you can see Washington the soldier and Washington the statesman. Washington during war, Washington during peacetime. This arch was modeled after the Arc de Triomphe of Paris, France, which is this big old arch over there. It's okay. It's not as, not as cool as this one, I guess. And you can see behind me, this is all the row. This is the row. It's a bunch of Greek Revival townhouses that were built here in the early 1800s, around the eight, late 1820s, 1830s. And the reason they were built was because a guy named Robert Randall owned all this land where this park is today. And he left it in his will to a trust that included the mayor of the city of New York. So that guy pushed the city to turn this into a park in 1826, which made the land go up in value. Oh, and he built these houses as like a little single unit development. These houses home to people like John Dos Passos, Gertrude Stein, and Edward Hopper, the guy who painted Nighthawks. All that means nothing to you, probably, so I'll just say that that's also where Will Smith lived in uh, I Am Legend. Maybe that's something you'll know. We're going to keep walking here, and you can see the fountain, which is lined up perfectly underneath the Washington Arch here. And they moved it, actually. A few years ago, they, pay, they paid like $3 million to move this, like 20 feet to the east, so it would line up perfectly under the arch to make a perfect photo for tourists. Oh, a nice way to use our tax dollars, right? But all around here, you see all the buildings that line Washington Square, a lot of them are owned by New York University. It's the largest private university in the country. It's also very expensive. It's like 72 grand to go there. It was founded in 1831 by Albert Gallatin, who was a former Treasury Secretary of the United States. But it's been home to alumni and professors like Jonas Salk, Oliver Stone, Alec Baldwin, Lady Gaga went there. And this park here is very famous as a gathering place for the students and also performers, very famous for its performers. People like Dave Chappelle used to perform here. Charlie Barnett, a very famous New York performer who was actually gonna be the cast member on Saturday Night Live before Eddie Murphy got it in the early 80s, used to perform in here. Uh, Lady Gaga, Bob Dylan, people like that used to just perform in this park. Anyways, this is the fountain and all this around here is Washington Square Park. And in fact, this park is actually built on old burial ground. They say there are thousands of dead bodies still buried underneath here. It's also haunted, supposedly. And not just by people trying to sell you drugs at night, because that happens too. So most of the buildings around here are owned by New York University. Uh, you can see the, the red building is the library. Over there is the Silver Center, which is where a lot of the uh, classrooms are located. In fact, where Samuel Colt invented the revolver, where uh, Samuel F.B. Morse, who was a professor here, he debuted the telegraph in here in the 1830s. Uh, yeah, a lot, of, a, lot of famous, a lot of famous people here. You see people performing and you can hear them playing right there. Yeah, I should go play. I play a little bit of guitar, no big deal. Here to the left is Judson Memorial Church. It was designed by Stanford White, made with money from the Rockefellers, if you know who they are. You know, the founders of the Illuminati, those guys. But that's actually a church here since 1888 it was put here. And now we're cutting through Washington Square to towards the Hangman's Elm, which is here in the northwest corner. And over here to the west of the park is 29 Washington Square. This is where Eleanor Roosevelt lived when FDR passed away. She lived here for a few years. And then here to the left is the Hangman's Elm. They say it's one of the oldest living things in New York at around 350 years old. They used to hang people in this park when it was a potter's field. They buried people here after yellow fever epidemics. The yellow fever epidemics are actually one of the reasons why this neighborhood became so filled with people. They were escaping the yellow fever epidemics in the late 1700s, early 1800s in lower Manhattan, which is where the city was, and it's what populated Greenwich Village. People were fleeing that. So now we're on McDougal Street and we're walking south. So a little bit too about Greenwich Village is that it's famous for being a kind of uh, bohemian neighborhood. 
Uh, one of the reasons it was bohemian was because the people who lived here early on were escaping the city. They were living in a village, right? So they had, tend to be more free thinking. They didn't care about what the, the mainstream thought as much. Also, lots of immigrants. Throughout the 1800s, tons and tons of immigrants lived here, and they didn't also, they also, they didn't care what people did with their time. They were just trying to make it in a new country. And the university. The university kind of kept it more free thinking as well. So people would escape here, people with alternative lifestyles, etc., including artists. So there were multiple like artistic renaissances here. Uh, Mid-1800s, people like Walt Whitman used to hang out here. Early 1900s, people like Eugene O'Neill uh, and playwrights and actors like that. Uh, and then in mid-1900s, when painters like Jackson Pollock and you know musicians like Bob Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel. So this over here to the left is actually NYU Law, law school. Uh, I know you're thinking, you're thinking, Tom, didn't you go to law school and now you're making YouTube videos? I'll ask the questions here, okay? But that's the law school. You can see all the NYU flags. The Statue of Liberty's torch is in the logo of the NYU. And over here to the left in the park are the chess tables. These chess tables have been here since the 1960s. People like Bobby Fischer used to play here. Celebrities like the Wu-Tang Clan, Amari Stoudemire, uh, Magnus Carlsen come to play here. Uh, they'll hustle you out of your money, so. We're about to walk into a construction site, so it's very loud. It's okay, this is New York, loud noises. So like I said, NYU famous for being a very fancy private university here in New York. Also famous for uh, making student films, one of which I acted in. No big deal, I'm an actor, no big deal. Thanks. If this isn't gonna help my diarrhea. But speaking of actors, here to the right is the Provincetown Playhouse, was the Provincetown Playhouse, which was founded in the early 1900s uh, by a group of actors who performed in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And they founded this here. Uh, people like Eugene O'Neill, Edna St. Vincent Millay, uh, Wallace Stevens used to produce stuff here. Uh, very, very important. It was only around for a few years, but it changed theater, brought it into the modern era, they say. And we're now walking on McDougal Street. By the way, I turned my hat around. I don't know if you noticed. It looks pretty sick, right? I had to. The light. You know? I gotta, gotta see the face. So let's keep walking. This is all McDougal Street. This is kind of the main drag uh, for all the NYU students and going out at night. It's very, very crowded on the weekends here at night. Really fun. But it's very historic and you're going to start seeing a little bit of change in architecture. You're going to start seeing more of the tenement buildings here. That's because to the south of Washington Square is where all the immigrants used to live. And those buildings were designed for immigrants. So here to the left you have 158 McDougal. This is where Louisa May Alcott actually lived for a bit and she wrote uh, part of Little Women here. Here to the right is Cafe Reggio, which has been here since 1927, a coffee shop. People like Bob Dylan, Khalil Gibran used to hang out there. Mom Moon's Falafel, 1971, really great drunk food, uh, or so I hear. So here to the right is Comedy Cellar, which is a very famous comedy club since 1982. People like Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock perform there. Maybe one day I'll perform there, you know? Uh, having been a lawyer, now being a tour guide means that I can teach you everything about New York, except how to succeed here. <laughs> here to the left, you have Mineta Tavern, which is named Mineta after the Mineta Creek, which used to run through here, right? It used to run all the way up to 23rd Street through what is now the park. But this used to be a speakeasy in the 1920s known as the Black Rabbit. People like John Steinbeck, Ed, Ernest Hemingway used to hang out here. It'd be pretty sick to hang out with those bros, right? <laughs> We're walking through Mineta Lane. It kind of winds, but it follows the path of what used to be the Mineta Creek. And we're walking off of McDougal, and we're gonna be walking onto Bleecker Street, which runs, uh, here at this point, runs east and west. And it used to be where a lot of the Italians lived. In fact, when Little Italy was in its heyday, it used to extend all the way up here. And it used to be where a lot of the northern Italians lived. Uh, Little Italy was so large. By the way, I have a, a video on Little Italy if you're interested. Uh, no big deal. Uh, sick plug. Yeah. But you can check it out on the link. We're around. We'll put it wherever. But when Little Italy was in its heyday, it used to actually have so many Italians that different streets within Little Italy represented different parts of Italy. And here on Bleecker Street, down to the south of us, is where a lot of the northern Italians lived. And we're going to walk through there and I'm going to show you a lot of the food. That's still left over, it's very good. Named after Anthony Bleeker, who ceded the street to the city to, to create all the housing and everything that they created on it. And just so you know, this isn't a whole official tour. I'm walking you guys through it. I'm talking a little bit. We're talking, we're getting to know each other. We're rapping, but this isn't a real tour. You want a whole tour, it's gonna be a little bit longer, a little more in depth. And that's gonna cost you, baby. So when you come to New York, just you know, look me up. Cool, all right, so we're walking towards 6th and Bleecker now. I was telling you, Bleecker used to be the street for a lot of the northern Italians back when the Italians were in their heyday here in the late 1800s. And over here is Our Lady of Pompeii, which was home to a man named Father Demo, who this square is named after. 
He actually provided a lot of support for the uh, families of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which happened at the Brown Building, what is the, today the Brown Building, off of Washington Square Park in 1911. Uh, over 100 immigrant women died when the building burned up. He was one of the people who consoled the families, and this is Father Demo Square. On it is Joe's Pizza, the famous Joe's Pizza, which was found in 1975. It's called Joe's Pizza because a man named Pino Puzzoli, he uh, it was an immigrant, he founded it. And how do you anglicize Pino Puzzoli? Joe. That's where Peter Parker worked in Spider-Man. Over here to the left, this is Carmine. On Carmine is where uh, Jackson Pollock lived, in a one-bedroom apartment that is now millions of dollars uh, in value. Go figure. You see it's kind of dead right now. This is a very fancy neighborhood. In fact, they say like close to 40% of the neighborhood just kind of left New York because people got money. So they're like, I'm not going to be in New York City during COVID, so they leave. I guess, I don't know, I guess can you blame them? I don't know. But I'm stuck here, baby. So I'm doing these tours for you. So this is Bleecker. You're going to see some really great food. I'm going to point it out as we go. Over here to the right, we're going to be passing by a place called Rocco's. And that's a bakery. Um, it was actually open in 1974 uh, by a man named Rocco Generoso. He used to work at the Zima Bakery, which was there before from the 1950s. The best cannoli in the city. Best cannoli. The, the reason it's so good is because they make it fresh. They actually you buy the shell and then they fill it right for you. Really, really good place. I recommend I bring everyone I know, all my friends when they come visit, I take them here. And go figure, your tour guide in New York, when all your friends visit New York, they just randomly call you up and they're like, hey man, want to walk around? It's very convenient. Here to the left, you have Murray's Cheese. is a man named Murray Greenberg, who uh, actually fought in the Spanish Civil War. He opened this when he came here. Really good cheeses. They're, they're all over the city now as well. Hey, what's up, man? And here to the left, you have a, a Faico's Italian Specialties. It used to be called Faico's Pork Store, but they changed the name because it was a little alienating for people who don't like pork. You'll see lots of vacancies here, too, unfortunately, though, because uh, as the neighborhood gets more and more expensive, this is even before the COVID, as the neighborhood gets more expensive, the, the landlords basically gamble. I, I talked about this in the Soho video that I just recently did. Sick plug. <laughs> Click here to see it. But as the neighborhood gets more expensive, the landlords just jack up the rents even further than the market asks for, basically gambling that it's going to continue to rise and someone locks in a commercial lease at 20 years for that much amount as opposed to less. Here to the left, you have John's of Bleecker Street, a pizzeria from 1929. The actual uh, baker there, the, the, the pizza chef, uh, studied under, the, uh, under uh, Gennaro Lombardi, who opened Lombardi's in um, Nolita. So that was opened in the late 1800s. So we're walking on Jones Street, which is pretty famous, and I'll tell you why in a second. That guy was just riding his bike, almost hit me because he was on his phone and he was riding on the sidewalk. Unbelievable. You know, bikers are the most dangerous people in New York. Forget the people you see in the movies, the cab drivers, and I'm walking here and all that stuff. The people who are going to knock you over and kill you are the bikers, believe it or not. It's a controversial statement. I don't shy away from controversy. So we're going to be walking on West 4th here in a second, and it's famous because uh, at 161 West 4th, which is going to be right up here, is where Bob Dylan got his first apartment. I don't know if you can tell I'm a Bob Dylan fan. He's great. Uh, I also made a video about Bob Dylan, so uh, you should check that out. Sick plug. Man, I'm just do knocking these out left and right. But up here on Jones Street is where he took the picture for his album, Freewheeling Bob Dylan, the famous album where he's on the cover with Susie Rotolo, his girlfriend. It's the album from 1963 that made him famous. So the one that includes Masters of War, A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, uh, and of course, Blowing in the Wind. The answer, my friends, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. It's pretty good singing for just off the cuff, come on. So this is it right here. You could see this facing down this way was where they took the picture. I should recreate this. All I need is uh, it to be snowing and a girlfriend. <laughs> Uh, both equally difficult to get right now. You can see the buildings here are very old. These buildings are all from the early 1800s. Federal style. You can see the little dormers up there. You can see the Flemish bond work, the brickwork. That's all typical of federal style buildings that are from the early 1800s here in New York. Very heavily influenced by Britain and the British influence here. Up here on the right is what used to be, this is Petit Optique. It used to be a place called Cafe Society. In the late 1930s, it was opened as the first integrated nightclub here. A uh, really big deal, a man named Barney Josephson. But it introduced this neighborhood and people here in downtown to people like Ella Fitzgerald. Billie Holiday actually made her debut here. And uh, she actually debuted her famous song, Strange Fruit, uh, which you're probably thinking is uh, about avocados. <laughs> well, it's actually about lynching. So, 
We're walking towards 7th Ave, which is actually kind of the western edge of Greenwich Village today. To the other side of it is now pretty much West Village, which I'll talk about in a different video, so stay tuned. I'm not very good at winking. And up here on the right, we're gonna be walking into a second, is where the Stonewall Inn is located. Now on June 28, 1969, the Stonewall riots occurred. Really big deal because this marks the beginning of the gay pride movement. Before the Stonewall riots, the gay community was always considered a pushover. The bars were all run by the mob, pretty much, and the city broke them up constantly. So on June 28, 1969, the police shows up to break it up and close it down, and people rebelled. They locked the police in, more police show up, more people from the community show up. It becomes a multi-day uh, protest, pretty much. People keep getting arrested. It becomes a really big deal, and uh, it eventually got rained out. But the following year, they held the Christopher Street March, which is the first gay pride uh, parade. And now they commemorate that date uh, all around the world with gay pride marches uh, the same way. Kind of interesting, and it's right over here to the left. Also, too, this neighborhood is known as being more uh, accepting of different lifestyles because of what I explained before and how it was isolated. In fact, 7th Avenue didn't exist until the 1900s. The subway wasn't here until the early 1900s. So it was always pretty isolated. It was literally a village. So it was a little more uh, away from the common norms and conventions of society. So we're not going into West Village, but I want to show you something here. This is the Hess Triangle, and this was actually owned by the family that lived here. They had a building, they owned an apartment building. And in 1910, uh, they were going to build the subway and 7th Avenue, so they were going to confiscate it by eminent domain. They, they resisted, they didn't want to give up their land. It wasn't until 1913 that they exhausted all the remedies, and uh, they said, well, okay, fine. The city took it, but when they surveyed it, they did it incorrectly and they left that little triangle on accident. The heirs of the man who owned these buildings, Hess, uh, said, you know what, we're just gonna keep it. And they didn't give it to them. They kept that little triangle. And to commemorate it, they put that little triangle there and it's still technically uh, considered a smallest piece of property in New York City. Kind of cool story. There you can see one world trade in the distance, 1,776 feet tall, the year of American independence. Over here to the right, you have Marie's Crisis, a very famous uh, piano bar. People always pop it in there to sing, people like Jimmy Fallon. It's actually where Thomas Paine died. Uh, if you know who Thomas Paine is, he wrote Common Sense, which was a pamphlet that really helped precipitate the American Revolution. This is all West Village, so we're not going in there. So calm yourselves. Okay, that's gonna be a different video. You gotta subscribe. Hey, that's one thing you can do. Let's talk about that. If you're, if you're watching this, you should subscribe. I mean, at the very least, you know? I'm like walking you around New York. I'm giving you some good stuff here. People pay really good money for this. Man, those sirens are so annoying. And someone's in there right now, like fighting for their lives, and here I am complaining about the sound. So here we are at Bleecker Street Pizza to the left. I also have a video about this. You should check it out. Ah, sick plug. Really, really good pizza. The Nona Maria slice is the best slice, in my opinion, in the city. This is the end of Bleecker Street. We kind of just looped around. But on the other side is West Village. If you continue down Bleecker, you get into the West Village. So we're going to end here in a second. But if you liked it, you know, please subscribe. That's the least you can do. Come on, you watch this whole thing, you learned a lot of stuff. What a concept. You learn stuff from YouTube. Good Lord. Uh, also follow me on Instagram. Trying to get enough followers to where I can get those comp trips to Tulum. I've told you that. I wanted to go out with my bros and get some sick video. And, you know, if you're ever in New York, hit me up. You can get in touch with me through Instagram or my website. And we're going to go into Bleecker Street Pizza. Eat. Yeah. <laughs> sick. See you later.